This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Coming up, Andrew Ferguson will join us. He's Chief Education Officer for Dalio Philanthropies. It's the philanthropic group of hedge fund giant Ray Dalio. Last April, it announced a public-private partnership with the state to help struggling students in Connecticut. The multi-million dollar venture is targeting public education, something other philanthropists have tried in multiple states, and outcomes have been mixed. We talk about this Connecticut partnership, including questions over transparency and how Dalio Philanthropies plans to achieve its goals to address persistent education disparities. That's later. First, what should be the role of philanthropy today? In recent years, foundations and other donors have helped nonprofits fill the gap in social services as state government cuts back. But with charitable giving declining, how much longer can nonprofits step in? You can join our conversation today, the number 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I want to welcome my in-studio guest, Carlo Fortunato, who's president of the Connecticut Council for Philanthropy. Uh, Carlo, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. And also joining us today from the studios at WGBH in Boston is Phil Buchanan, who's president of the Center for Effective Philanthropy and author of Giving Done Right, Effective Philanthropy and Making Every Dollar Count. Uh, Phil, thanks for joining us here on Where We Live. Thanks for having me, Lucy. I wanted to start with Carla because you are here in Connecticut. I mentioned you lead the Connecticut Council for Philanthropy. So what kind of work does do you support your organization? And when I talk about social services, how does that come into play? Well, I work with um, foundations, corporations, and businesses, and some individual donors throughout the state who are making investments in Connecticut's nonprofit sector. And um, we bring people together to help make greater impact when they have shared goals or shared um, aims in the state. Um, We help people learn from each other because, um, you know, a lot of philanthropy is trying to address uh, it's kind of stubborn social problems. And so we bring people together so they can learn from each other. And then we also help to raise the visibility of philanthropy in um, in an effort to encourage more people to make donations to great causes. Uh, coming up, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about uh, efforts uh, by philanthropy uh, to address you know, educational disparities, which is a big topic here in our state. Uh, when you talk with foundations and, and other donors, you know, what are some of the, the causes you mentioned that they're really passionate about? Yeah. So there are three big areas of philanthropy that the vast majority of charitable giving goes to. Um, The first is education. You know, people here in Connecticut, um, around the country too, but here in Connecticut, education is a really important um, priority. And um, for example, um, uh, our community foundations and other foundations are supporting millions of dollars to uh, help send Connecticut's kids to college, right? Millions of dollars are spent every year on scholarships. Um, a lot of philanthropy is focused on health. So uh, uh, foundations and donors are making grants to organizations that provide health services, or maybe they're trying to work upstream and help keep people healthier. But philanthropy is really focused on keeping Connecticut's uh, residents and communities healthier. And then they are also really focused on human services. We know that some people fall on hard times or fall through the cracks. And uh, philanthropy is supporting a lot of organizations that are working to make sure people um, have housing, to make sure they have enough food on their table, and to help um, help connect them to kind of uh, uh, sustainable wage jobs when um, when the current job they have is not really helping them pay the bills. Mm. I mentioned Phil Buchanan is with us. I believe he'll be in Connecticut uh, tomorrow uh, yes. to speak to uh, nonprofits and others in our state. But Phil, when we look at uh, philanthropy generally in uh, the country, uh, is much of that work uh, f- that philanthropists are doing uh, geared towards uh, these nonprofit causes? Yeah, I mean, philanthropy supports a nonprofit sector that is vast and diverse. 1.5 million uh, organizations in this country, everything from, you know, Harvard to the homeless shelter. Um, When I think about the nonprofit sector in this country, I think that it is a sector that touches literally every American, uh, whether it is because uh, you or your family came on hard times and you needed to go to the food pantry, whether it's because you took your kids to the nonprofit 
uh, Children's Museum, or perhaps you listen every day to the nonprofit uh, uh, public radio station. <laughs> uh, there, there is um, a a incredible uh, array of uh, activities being done every day, and they're often, uh, as Carla said. Um, working nonprofits supported by philanthropy on the toughest challenges, the ones that have defied um, market or government solutions. And I think we underappreciate and and often take for granted uh, all of the ways in which our lives are better uh, than they would otherwise be because of the work of the nonprofit sector, again, supported by institutional and individual giving. Uh, we hear from uh, nonprofits here in our state, also from art institutions, that uh, charitable giving is down. Um, people aren't donating uh, as much that are able to support uh, these organizations uh, across the country. You know, what are some of the factors behind that, Phil? Well, yeah, and it's a complicated story because the the most recent data we have uh, comes from Giving USA. It's 2018 uh, relative to 2017. Overall, giving is up, but that's really buoyed by foundation giving. And as as you say, uh, Lucy, you're absolutely right, individual giving is slightly down for the first time in a number of years. That comes on top of a worrisome trend of just a decline in the rate of uh, households giving. It's still a majority of American households that 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 give to charity. Still more Americans give to charity than vote in a presidential election, but it has been on a steady decline uh, and, and that's that's obviously um, concerning. And and one of the uh, contributing factors likely was the 2017 tax law that dramatically reduced the number of um, folks who are itemizing and therefore getting the benefit of the tax deduction for their charitable contributions. So it is a challenging uh, moment for for nonprofits, especially for the vital smaller community based nonprofits that are you know, often doing heroic work. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in, in working on the on the book that you mentioned, just just spending time with nonprofit staff uh, on the front lines at community health organizations, at organizations that are working, for example, to recruit uh, gang involved young people out of gang life and and get their lives turned around. These are unsung uh, American heroes, and we need to find those organizations in our communities that are doing that work and and support them. You're hearing Phil Buchanan, president of the Center for Effective Philanthropy, also author of Giving Done Right, Effective Philanthropy and Making Every Dollar Count. As we explore the question of the role of philanthropy today, you can join us 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, Ken's calling from Hartford. Ken, go ahead. Ken, are you there? I have a, I have a question. Yes, I am. I have a question. And it's just, it, you know, I hear you talking about the fundamental lack of giving, and, and I'm watching a, a rocketing wealth inequality in this state, and I often wonder, why don't we just tax billionaires out of existence to pay for all the social needs? Because I used to work for a not-for-profit, and it used to be really frustrating when I'd call up a foundation and say, hey, can you give? And you Can you give for the fundamental human right of helping young children read how, learn how to read? And they'd say, but there are a 100 other programs as worthy as you. Mm. And you sit there and say to yourself, well, if there's a hundred other programs as worthy as me and you're one foundation, there's not enough foundation money to cure all of the problems. So why don't we just tax wealth? Ken, a uh, good point. I know, uh, Phil, uh, you've taken on this, uh, this question uh, many times uh, through your work. So how do you address uh, Ken's concern? Well, I, I personally agree with Ken that, that uh, we should uh, tax the wealthy at a much higher rate uh, than we currently are. Uh, and then um, in the meantime, uh, we have work to do every day. And so if we have elected leaders, as we have, that appear unwilling to do that for the time being, I think we should simultaneously, uh, you know, hopefully work to affect that and encourage the wealthy to give um, so that um, they're, they're, they're in fact uh, helping on the issues that, that Ken describes as opposed to, uh, you know, buying yet another yacht. So, I mean, I, I share the frustration I just think that, you know, here we are, uh, we have made the choices, you know, as a body politic that we have, um, taxes are what they are. And my role, what I sort of work on day to day, is then trying to convince people that um, if they have resources, 
uh, that they can use them philanthropically and to try to do that effectively. But I hear the frustration and I share it. Mm. And what about the the critique, uh, you know, that that people have uh, uh, not as much trust in philanthropy today. They see it as a tax shelter for the wealth, the wealthy. I mean, how do you address that skepticism? Well, I mean, I, I think skepticism is is healthy in general of everything. Uh, and uh, and so, so I think that um, what we want to do is um, try to highlight uh, the examples that we can learn from of both effective and ineffective philanthropy. So there has been a sort of backlash. Um, there's always been a lot of critique uh, throughout American history of the way in which the mega wealthy can use philanthropy to um, you know, influence things in, in their in their favor. But there also is an incredibly rich history of um, philanthropy that makes a tremendous difference. You know, worries that we don't have uh, that we would otherwise have. We don't worry that our kid's going to die of yellow fever because the Rockefeller Foundation supported research that led to a vaccine. And there are count, countless other examples. So I think we need a robust conversation about uh, about philanthropy. We need to critique uh, in a specific way. But I think the sort of generalized backlash that has really been on the upswing in the last uh, year or two in which um, there's almost this reasoning that, um, you know, because we can identify folks like Jeffrey Epstein or the Sacklers, you know, who clearly are horrible people who did horrible things uh, and also appear to have used philanthropy to sort of uh, buttress their reputation. Therefore, that's somehow representative of philanthropy broadly. That's just not true. Uh, and, and you know, we work at the Center for Effective Philanthropy with many of the biggest foundations in the country and the world. Uh, they are staffed by folks who are deeply committed uh, to making a positive difference with the resources that they usually had nothing to do with, you know, how they were accumulated in the first place. We need to encourage uh, giving and not to be too cynical uh, or paint with too broad a brush. Uh, Carla uh, Fortunata, I'm wondering if you can add to that uh, as someone here uh, in Connecticut as president of the Connecticut Council for Philanthropy. You know, that, uh, as Phil mentioned, this uh, uh, this um, outpouring or increase that we're seeing of people who are not uh, very uh, trusting of philanthropy today because of some of these high profile uh, names that he mentioned. Well, I think that, you know, one of the unfortunate things about philanthropy is that it actually does its work really quietly. And we don't really hear about it unless it's in the extraordinary realm of horrible and shocking or amazing. Um, and the reality is that there's just a lot that 99.9% .9 of the philanthropy that's happening across the state is quietly trying to make a really positive difference in people's lives every day. Um, and uh, um, one of the things I actually wanted to mention is that while there has been um, – uh, has been a decline nationally in giving. In Connecticut, it's been a far slower decline. Like we still have a, a very robust amount of giving, giving happening in the state and a really strong kind of culture of generosity. Um, in fact, Connecticut's one of the most generous states in the country and New England is the most generous region in the country. We're going to continue our discussion about the role of philanthropy today. My guest, Carla Fortunato, in studio here, and also Phil Buchanan from WGBH in Boston. Uh, he's at the studio there, president of the Center for Effective Philanthropy and author of Giving Done Right, Effective Philanthropy and Making Every Dollar Count. Uh, coming up, we're going to learn just how much nonprofits in Connecticut have stepped up to provide needed services to residents. How can they continue to do this with declining state government support and declines in charitable giving. You can join us 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're talking about the role of philanthropy with my guest, Carla Fortunato, president of the Connecticut Council for Philanthropy, and Phil Buchanan, who joins us from WGBH in Boston. He's president of the Center for Effective Philanthropy and author of Giving Done Right. Now, charitable giving supports nonprofits. And in Connecticut, many of these nonprofits provide needed social services in our state, 
Yet Connecticut has cut back on funding these nonprofits in lean budget years, while demand for these services grows. To tell us more about what's happening in Connecticut, joining us by phone is John Carl Casa, president and CEO of the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance. Uh, John Carl, welcome to our show. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I have talked about social services uh, several times. So when we uh, mention that, uh, tell us what kind of services these nonprofits in Connecticut are providing uh, state residents. Nonprofits in Connecticut, and we're talking about community-based nonprofits, uh, provide a range of services that people need. We're talking about organizations that provide behavioral health services, substance abuse treatment, emergency shelters, services for people with intellectual disabilities, um, services that help people move from incarceration back to the community, and many, many more services that people depend on. And these services at one time or another, the state of Connecticut uh, fully uh, supported, uh, but now there have been more contracts with nonprofits over the years? I think the way to look at it is that nonprofits are essentially the um, organizations that implement the state's um, social services policy, the state's network of providing services to people. Um, something like uh, 80% of social services are provided by nonprofits in the community. Um, so they are a vital part of the infrastructure um, and the network that Connecticut uses to provide for people. So what you've been seeing in recent years is that the state uh, support uh, to nonprofits to continue providing these services has decreased? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think there are a couple of things people need to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, um, that because of difficult state finances, the programs run by nonprofits have fallen behind by hundreds of millions of dollars in buying power over the last decade. Uh, there is a misbelief on the part of people that, oh, nonprofits will do their jobs anyway. Um, what we have found is that over the last decade, as funding has not kept up with increased demand, that that's just simply not the case. The programs are being cut that people are doing without. And, you know, when you talk about programs and services, those are kind of neutral business words. What we're talking about are things that uh, people need, services that people need, that they depend on, and they suffer real pain when those things aren't there. I understand uh, that uh, your organization had a proposal for uh, the state of Connecticut uh, to use some of its rainy day fund uh, to uh, help address uh, some of these uh, these costs uh, to provide these needed services, as you mentioned. Tell us more about that proposal. You know, um, I think the, the question is that Connecticut's state government needs to step up to its obligation to provide people. And the source of the funding isn't as important as the understanding on the part of state officials that that obligation needs to be um, increased. The state is clearly in the best fiscal position it's been in years, and it's in the position where it can begin to make up for shortfalls. Just a day or two ago, uh, we saw a report that the state has generated an additional $102 million in sales tax revenue uh, be between July and December over the year before. So sales tax revenues are very strong. The um, estimates and finals portion of the state income tax um, is now $318 million above uh, the budgetary level set. That's surplus money that's available. So, you know, we're not as concerned with the source of the revenue. We think that um, if you look at state finances, we have now seen more than one year where state revenues have been on the increase. Uh, these are organizations that have suffered when state budget times were not so good. And it's time for the state, now that financial times are better, to, to make up the difference and try to get them back on, on to uh, square footing. But uh, when we ask lawmakers uh, that uh, very question, including Governor Lamont, uh, they point to the pension liabilities that the state has as well as now uh, lately, uh, how are they going to pay for a transportation project? So I'm just wondering, uh, when you say that there's a surplus in uh, sales tax and with income tax, uh, you know, that there should be money towards these social services, you hear what lawmakers are saying. So I mean, how do you uh, get to a compromise, uh, John Carl? Well, I think um, nonprofits that provide services have compromised for a decade. As the um, 
state budget problems have mounted over the last 10 years. It, only a portion of the state budget has been available for cuts, and nonprofits have absorbed more than their share. Um, it's not um, a matter of them getting sort of this um, invisible revenue. It is a, it's a matter of um, the state's quality of life. Um, it's a matter of the way in which residents and people who need services can live day to day, week to week, month to month. Um, state government is about making choices. and It's about making choices between competing needs and competing demands. Um, we think that the services provided by community organizations, such as the ones that I represent, um, need to be at the front of the line finally after many, many years of being at the back of the line. I wanted to bring into the conversation Carlo Fortunato, again, president of the Connecticut Council for Philanthropy. I believe that uh, you were in the audience when Governor Lamont uh, mentioned that uh, he doesn't want to use any of the Rainy Day Fund uh, to help uh, increase uh, support to these nonprofits who have been flat funded for years. I mean, what is your response when you hear that from from policymakers? I was in the audience, um, and I, I, um, I found it a, a little bit frustrating because he also said that he thought philanthropy should be filling those gaps. And from where I sit, um, philanthropy is funding nonprofits around this state with hundreds of millions of dollars every year. So on one hand, um, you know, I think the philanthropic community is with the governor. We do like we do want to see a really strong nonprofit sector, and um, and philanthropy is investing um, really significant resources to that. And in fact, every year our state's foundations have been giving well above um, the national average of uh, what foundations are giving. So. Um, I think foundations very much want a strong nonprofit sector, but feel like they're 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 in already mm -hmm. uh, to do that to do that. Uh, Phil Buchanan, again, president of the Center for Effective Philanthropy, as you hear uh, about the the conversation happening in Connecticut, uh, you know what should be the role of nonprofits when we think about uh, government providing services, uh, and this is something that probably plays out in many states. Yeah, it is. And, and I think um, nonprofits do play a crucial role often in providing um, needed services. I, I think just to step back, that the root of um, some of what we're talking about is really just a lack of appreciation and respect for the work of community-based nonprofits. I mean, there are so many stereotypes we hear about the nonprofit sector and um, you know, people say uh, nonprofits should operate more like business, whatever that even means, whether that's the, you know, the dry cleaner or Google, I never know, um, or that nonprofit workers are overpaid, which is, you know, you go, go to any community-based um, nonprofit with seven or eight staff and, you know, ask folks, you know, what they're paid and, and it's, it's uh, they're anything but. It's the opposite uh, problem, uh, typically. You, you, you have all of these stereotypes um, when the reality is running these organizations uh, takes everything it takes to run an equivalent sized business and a ton more. Um, but the story in this country for the last 10, 20, 30 years has been all about markets and business. And we've neglected this vital part uh, of our societal fabric. And uh, we've even gotten confused uh, to the point where, you know, young people coming out of college sometimes think that. Uh, you know, going to McKinsey is like is like joining the Peace Corps or something. Uh, but it is it is the nonprofit sector that is doing, uh, you know, crucial work that is not driving, you know, profit or returns to anyone. Uh, it's about the mission. And, and I just think um, both government officials, uh, b business leaders need to stop uh, dissing the nonprofit sector and start elevating it. It's not perfect, obviously, uh, but but uh, there are just so so many crucial uh, activities being done every day in communities around this country. And I think as a society, we're just underappreciating it. You talk about that in your book, Phil, uh, Giving Done Right, Effective Philanthropy and Making Every Dollar Count. So can you, uh, again, people want to expect certain outcomes, as you mentioned, sure. if they're investing their money. Sure. But you're saying that you shouldn't, people shouldn't just look at uh, these uh, nonprofits uh, as operating, philanthropies operating like businesses. So, you know, how do you counsel uh, the people that want to make sure that the outcomes are being met? 
Yeah. I mean, there is a desire, and I understand, for like the analog to, you know, profit or return on investment, some some ratio by 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 which we can compare, you know, a nonprofit uh, working on climate change to a nonprofit working to increase graduation rates in Hartford. But it doesn't it doesn't work that way in the nonprofit world. Performance measurement is really, really important. Um, but it's way more complicated because the the ultimate outcomes are not captured in the financial statements. So so it, you got to be patient, and you you need to look for organizations that can clearly explain uh, what they're trying to do, um, how they're trying to do it, and what information they have that suggests that they're on that they're on the right track. And 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 when an organization has a, a convincing story to tell uh, and and information and data that supports that story. Uh, and their goals overlap with yours, then then you should support them in a big way. And and you shouldn't um, obsess about things like overhead ratios, which um, a lot of the charity um, rating websites use that really don't tell you anything about results. They tell you about um, how the budget is allocated. And often, actually, um, they, they can lead uh, – the emphasis on overhead rates leads to some really counterproductive behaviors like not paying people enough or not investing in the – Infrastructure and technology require to be more effective. Uh, so, so it is it is tricky. It is different, and and I think as a donor, you sort of have to understand that, embrace that difference, and then do the work of trying to find uh, effective organizations. Uh, John Carl Casa, who's on the phone with us, president and CEO of the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance. I'm wondering if you could respond uh, to what uh, Phil Buchanan mentioned. And as we get ready for another uh, Connecticut uh, legislative session to begin, you know, how you continue to make that case to uh, policymakers. Sure. Um, you know, the last point that Phil made was about um, overhead and how people don't like the idea of paying overhead to nonprofits. Uh, you know, they would not, nobody would go into a pizza parlor and say, look, I, you know, I'll pay for the mozzarella and I'll pay for the dough, but I don't want to pay for the lights or the people who are throwing the dough in the air. Um, it's just, and that's what overhead is. Overhead is the lease and the cost of the building. It's the insurance and the heat. It's the people that come in every day and do the work. Um, and he's right. Um, businesses, uh, for-profit businesses, would not be expected to do the jobs that Connecticut's nonprofits are, are being asked to do by the state under the um, payment situation that nonprofits face right now. Um, it has been a decade of nonprofits doing their jobs um, without adequate funding. And, you know, if there are a couple of things, folks, I'd like folks to think about um, and take away from today's discussion, it's that, you know, first, Nonprofits have absorbed cuts over the last decade uh, and, um, and funding that has not kept up with increases. Um, secondly, the discussion we're having about charitable giving is important, and it's an important part of the financing of community nonprofits. Um, but it's at most just a few percent of the revenue that human services providers need. They cannot function without state payments for the services they provide. Um, and thirdly, as I was mentioning earlier, the state is in the best fiscal position it's been in years, and it's time for the state to step up and, and try to, to make up for the shortfalls that, that have happened over the last decade. Well, I wanted to go back to Carlo Fortunato, president of the Connecticut Council for Philanthropy. Uh, you mentioned that uh, philanthropy shouldn't be filling in uh, these budget gaps for Connecticut. So, uh, you know, what is a productive way that the money should be used in these foundations if, if the state isn't ponying up and these services are growing and are needed? Well, I mean, one thing I will say is that philanthropy does you know, is supporting nonprofits in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I was trying to think of a good metaphor for how to talk about the really complementary relationships that the state government, um, Connecticut philanthropy, and Connecticut nonprofits kind of have in relationship to each other. And it's like, um, the state government is laying down the railroad tracks and the nonprofits are our trains and philanthropy can fuel up those trains or maybe they can help the conductor map a route, but that they simply don't have the same level of resources, um, nor should they be expected to kind of do the job of our state government. Um, there are other things that they are doing. A lot of times philanthropy will support things that are kind of difficult to cover the costs of, like um, maybe a nonprofit needs new software to do its work well, and a lot of our foundations will fund that, or they will, you know, help them replace the hot water heater that suddenly broke down. Um, 
uh, you know, philanthropy can help nonprofits innovate. Uh, one of the things they like to do is kind of fund innovation in the social sector, um, uh, new ways of solving social problems, and, and that's something that they can do. Um, uh, and they can also really commit for the long term. There are bigger ambitions that philanthropy has, uh, trying to kind of reduce and end poverty or um, uh, reduce uh, racial discrimination or um, uh, end homelessness. They have these big ambitions. And um, and they're really, f- many foundations are really focused on these kind of long-term um, solutions to big social problems. Mm. Well, I want to thank Carla Fortunata for joining us today, president of the Connecticut Council for Philanthropy. Uh, Carla, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Also to John Carl Casa, president and CEO of the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance. Uh, Phil Buchanan's going to stay with us, president of the Center for Effective Philanthropy and author of Giving Done Right, Effective Philanthropy and Making Every Dollar Count. As we look more at the role of philanthropy here on uh, today's Where We Live, I'm Lucy Nalpathangel. Coming up, we actually want to take a look at this multi-million dollar public-private venture in Connecticut that hopes to tackle the state's public education challenges. After the break, we hear from Dolly Philanthropies, and we take your questions too. Join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're talking about the role of philanthropy. Uh, my guest from WGBH is Phil Buchanan, president of the Center for Effective Philanthropy and author of Giving Done Right, Effective Philanthropy and Making Every Dollar Count. Uh, one uh, philanthropic effort that's getting a lot of attention in recent months is this multi-million dollar public-private partnership that aims to address educational disparities in Connecticut. Hedge fund giant Ray Dalio's group, Dalio Philanthropies, has promised $100 million towards this effort, money that be matched by state funds and potentially additional private donors. But how exactly will it help struggling schools? Uh, to get more information on this, Andrew Ferguson joins me now in studio. He's chief education officer for Dalio Philanthropies and also senior advisor to the Partnership for Connecticut. This is the public-private venture to help disengage students in uh, our state. Andrew, welcome to our show. Hi, Lisey. Thanks for having me. Hopefully I got your titles correct. <laughs> you have. Excited to be here. Uh, so tell us uh, about uh, why Dalio Philanthropies has set their eye on education uh, issues in our state. Mm -hmm. So for more than 10 years, Barbara Dalio has been leading the work on behalf of Dalio Philanthropies to work with educators, communities, mayors, young people across Connecticut. And particularly her heart is greatest for those young people who are showing sign of disengagement, disconnection from school. And so through her 10 years of work, she's learned a lot from educators and young people themselves about their experiences. That's led her to the realization and the finding that in Connecticut, more than one in five young people of high school age are showing sign of disengagement and disconnection from school. We aim to do something about that in collaboration with many. Mm. Uh, so when you mention one in five are disengaged, so are they dropping out or they're in the juvenile justice system? Can you tell us more about what you mean? So they have incredible unrealized potential, and yet they're showing sign of disengagement because they're either struggling to pass all the courses required for the graduation, they're struggling to be uh, present in school, they're struggling with chronic absenteeism, they're struggling through expulsions or other behavioral infractions. Uh, They're just struggling to really connect to what is their passion, realize their true strength and potential as young people. Mm. So tell us about this this structure in place, this uh, private-public partnership or venture that I mentioned. I guess it's the partner for Connecticut Incorporated. Tell us uh, who makes up the board and how you're going to do this work. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly exciting. So it's a different endeavor. This is a a one of a kind thing that Connecticut has put together that the nation is watching because at its core, it's an independent nonprofit organization led by a board of 13 terrific individuals. Of the board today, we have 12. We're in the process of hiring through a national search for president and CEO to be the lucky 13. Of the 12, we have the five top leaders of the state of Connecticut, including the governor and bipartisan legislative leaders from the Senate and the House. We also have Connecticut's Teacher of the Year. We have the president of AFT Connecticut. We have the dean of the Yale School of Management. We have the director of the Governor's Workforce Council. We have Barbara Dalio. We have other incredible citizens who are given their time on a voluntary basis to serve as the founding board to help create this really unique and special opportunity for the state. 
Uh, Phil Buchanan's with us from WGBH. Uh, Phil, uh, what's your response to uh, Dalio Philanthropies uh, setting their eye on fixing or its eye on fixing and helping fix uh, education in the state? It's been done before by other philanthropists, or at least uh, they've uh, tried to do it. Yeah, I think um, I think it's obviously a really important issue, and I applaud the initiative uh, to you know put resources. Uh, behind an effort to improve uh, educational opportunity for per- particularly for the most uh, disengaged as as Andrew describes them I, I think you know I mentioned earlier that uh, philanthropy is responsible for many great um, successes much progress much we take for granted uh, as good in our lives but if you were to pinpoint an area where there's been sort of the most um, uh, failure to meet high expectations, uh, failure to realize ambitious goals. It has been education. Uh, so we can talk about the Annenberg uh, uh, $500 million effort in the 90s. Uh, we can talk about the Gates Foundation's efforts to break large high schools into small high schools, and that didn't have the hope for results. And then they moved to teacher evaluation, and that didn't have the hope for results and then Common Core and so on. And there are so many examples. Um, So I think it's just really important to be um, sober about how difficult it is to improve educational outcomes and also to be humble about um, the expertise and knowledge that exists on the ground uh, in uh, teachers, in students, uh, families, uh, parents. In fact, at CEP, Center for Effective Philanthropy, uh, where I work, we actually um, saw so many education funders struggling to really hear from students that we created an initiative called Youth Truth, uh, youthtruthsurvey.org, which has now surveyed uh, over a million uh, students in schools schools across the country because because actually they have a really really important perspective on on what is what is best for them. So um, I, I just think there's lots of cautionary tales, and I hope that uh, this initiative in Connecticut. Uh, sort of take stock of those cautionary tales and avoid some of the predictable pitfalls. So Andrew Ferguson uh, with uh, the Partnership for Connecticut and also uh, Dalio Philanthropies uh, mentioning some of these examples of, of education outcomes that didn't quite uh, come to be. Uh, so what, how are you avoiding making those mistakes again? Mm-hmm. So look, as a former public school teacher in New Haven, Connecticut, I can say Phil is right. Education is complicated. Uh, it is a deeply human endeavor. And so how we avoid some of the pitfalls from others and look, we are learning to ourselves every single day we strive to become better. We do have a deep humility to our work, and we start with learning from the experience of young people themselves. Through 10 years of her leadership, Barbara Daly has spent a lot of time in communities and schools across the state learning from young people. What we learn from them, we take and then apply to her giving. And she creates then opportunities with educators, with mayors, with others in response directly to what we hear from young people. So that's point one. Point two is we are innovative. We keep learning. We keep changing. We keep improving. We strive to to deliver on what we're intending to do, which is to help those that, that we are trying to give to serve. Well, what about uh, trust? Uh, I was looking at that Newark example uh, when uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, tried to infuse a lot of money uh, to, to help uh, those schools, and the community uh, really wasn't part of the conversation. So you're saying at least the community is, uh, and educators are at least part of this from the front end. But as you know, uh, there were a lot of concerns about transparency, this partnership for Connecticut uh, being exempt from a FOIA and other government ethics laws. So doesn't that impact trust on the ground from the get-go? So building on uh, uh, Barbara's work and a key difference between the new work example is we already have 10 years of this work in community building trust and using the relationships that we've built to really help create this partnership. And so look at the compilation of the board. It is bringing together different groups that don't always trust each other. And part of what we've tried to develop is the ability for this board and the organization, the nonprofit, to create the opportunity to reach compromise. We believe deeply that for this work to succeed, for it to help the young people it's intended to serve, the board and the CEO and the rest of the team will have to find ways to compromise. Finding ways to compromise is far easier when you have the flexibility to have conversations in private when necessary and yet be very open about how money is spent, how money is raised, what programs are funded and why. You know, there will never be a question about how money that is part of this partnership for Connecticut is one, received, second, used, and three, what comes from that uh, investment. 
Today, you can go on the partnership's website, ConnecticutPartnership.org, and you can find the organizational budget of the partnership. You can find the meeting minutes from the various meetings. You can find far more materials than you otherwise would on most nonprofit organizations. How many meetings have you had so far? So, so far, we've had two Mm -hmm. board meetings, one organizational meeting in October, the most recent board meeting being in December, and the next meeting uh, this coming March. And so, uh, as you move forward, how much of your work will be public? You said that at times, some of these conversations need to happen in private. But you know, how much of that will be public facing where people can engage? And uh, as far as uh, additional money towards this effort in the future, will people be able to uh, make a- anonymous donations? Or is that something that you're going to be more transparent about as well? The budget and the numbers are always public. How board members vote, what they support, always public. The conversations that we're having now by which we're soliciting ideas and input from educators, nonprofits, community organizations, employers, uh, parents across the state through an RFI and a parent survey process, what we learn through all of that will be public. The conversations we have in communities across the state are public. How that information then is pulled together and used to help sharpen the focus of the partnership, which, by the way, its mission is to help disengage, disconnected young people ages 14 to 24 connect to the educational and career opportunities they need to succeed in life. All of that work we want to do in a very inclusive and open manner, as we have been doing, Mm -hmm. with also the flexibility to be effective, to deliver on the outcomes that we seek to do, to really realize the mission and aspiration of this partnership. Mm -hmm. When you say uh, to be flexible, and uh, I'm just curious what you mean by that in terms of of, of reaching these goals, because it is a complicated uh, issue, as you mentioned earlier. Absolutely. Flexibility is at its core. Design is iterative. And if you look at the way that we've built this nonprofit organization with the board, we've tried very hard to create as much space for creativity, innovation, iteration, learning along the way through input with community, young people, and others. And so as an example of that, we've tried to pull in ideas from uh, different uh, organizations, nonprofits, and educators across the state that we will use to help shape what was by its intent a very high-level aspirational vision that was first articulated. Now the particulars are being developed with input from community and how those uh, uh, particulars then translate into funded opportunities. Those opportunities then will be uh, started and begun. And then as uh, we get additional feedback uh, through the implementation of these programs and projects, we will continue to iterate and evolve uh, relative to our goals to make a difference for young people. You're hearing Andrew Ferguson, Chief Education Officer for Philanthropies and Senior Advisor for the Partnership for Connecticut. I wanted Phil Buchanan uh, to uh, uh, get back into the conversation. He's president of the Center for Effective Philanthropy. Uh, Phil, I I talked uh, with Andrew about uh, transparency. Again, this is a public-private venture, uh, Dalio putting in $100 uh, million, but another $100 million of taxpayer money is uh, being used uh, for this partnership. And so uh, moving forward, as you had written in your op-ed about this uh, philanthropic effort, you know, what are some ways to strengthen this uh, partnership even further so that people have their their concerns uh, uh, met? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned um, the effort in Newark, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's effort, uh, and and I think there's so many cautionary tales, as you alluded to, uh, Lucy, of of n- of not really recognizing um, people's deep connection to you know their neighborhood schools and and their sense of of um, ownership uh, of 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 those schools and and so I think openness and transparency is therefore crucial as well as um, real engagement, um, which Andrew alluded to, which is great with with people who are um, who are in communities. You know, it's it's I think too often we see um, major donors make the mistake of thinking that there is a quick fix or that they can best identify what um, other people need. But I really believe that um, the most important expertise is the expertise born of actually living through a challenge, that, that, that we need to really hear from the people we seek to help about what will uh, be most helpful. Uh, and so that would be, I think, um, and it sounds like, you know, Andrew's alluding to some some ways that the the, the partnership is seeking to do that. But, but I, I just think that's so often uh, where, where, where things fall apart. Uh, 
And people are the best experts, after all, on their own lives. And there are ways to solicit that input. And, and, and the other thing I would mention is that, is that there are a lot of other foundations, including foundations in Connecticut, that have worked on these very issues uh, over, over many, many years. And, and one of the other mistakes that I see a big foundation sometimes make is thinking that they have to come up with a new approach or they have to invent it or, or own it, when the fact is uh, sometimes the most effective thing is to support what somebody else is already doing uh, and to really be sober about the fact that nothing uh, really important gets done by a, by a single uh, institution acting alone. We just have a couple of minutes left. I wanted to go back to Andrew Ferguson. Uh, so uh, you mentioned the people that are on this board for the Partnership for Connecticut, but how are you directly speaking to students who are disengaged and also uh, their parents and other leaders in their communities about uh, some of the ways that you can help them? Mm-hmm. So we're beginning the conversations and underscore beginning. What we're putting together here is a long-term collaborative effort to work with people. And so initially for parents, we've asked for their feedback through a few ways, the primary way initially being the survey. And so parents, uh, if you have ideas, wish to share your experiences uh, from, from your own situations, we would love to hear from you. The survey is available at ConnecticutPartnership.org. We will use the survey information to help inform and shape the strategy of the partnership as it continues to evolve and take shape. Second, we'll continue conversations in communities, in schools themselves. Building on Barbara Daly's approach of 10 years, we are in schools meeting with kids. We learn and thrive from that energy and insights as we get smart by listening to students. We then use what we learn to help improve ways to uh, address and respond to what they've asked for, which is ways to help them realize their potential. So we'll continue to do that going forward, and particularly we'll do more of that as a CEO's name for the partnership. Keep in mind the partnership has a terrific board of directors and yet no staff. I am simply a volunteer on a part-time basis to help move it along as we search for a CEO. Can I ask, Andrew, how long uh, Dalio Philanthropies intends to invest in the state of Connecticut's children? So the initial pledge of $100 million is over five years. And the idea here is within five years, we need to prove that this model is beginning to, to Phil's point, it's very complicated and hard long-term work without any one magic solution. It's beginning to show promise. It's beginning to show demand from communities community that this is the Connecticut partnership, not the Dalio partnership, but the Connecticut partnership. And within five years, we hope to really show that this is beginning to bear fruit in a way that can become an enduring structure of the Connecticut community to help those who are disengaged and disconnected from opportunity. Well, we hope to have uh, the Partnership for Connecticut back on the show to talk about this work as you continue. Andrew Ferguson, thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me. Also, thanks to Phil Buchanan, president of the Center for Effective Philanthropy and author of Giving Done Right, Effective Philanthropy and Making Every Dollar Count. We'll tweet out a link to his op-ed uh, at the Connecticut Mirror about some mistakes uh, that philanthropists have made in the past and uh, what they need to correct for in the future. Phil, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks. It was fun talking with you, Lucy. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. Learn more about the show. Download Where We Live on your favorite podcast app. As always, thanks for listening.